But what is valid is that the only way to make uh, meaningful change is to first work on yourself. Uh, what most people tend to do is do a little bit of work on themselves and get a couple of wild notions and then go and try and impose those on other people. That's actually a very negative behavior. It's, it's the ego trying to skip out on being disciplined by disciplining other people. And that is a major source of conflict. So I would say that facing up to the fact that we are representative of all the same problems we see in the world around us and dealing with those within ourselves is the critical place to start. Namaste. You're listening to the Savannah Podcast. Join us on an exploration of Eastern spirituality, yoga philosophy, and conscious living for the new age. This podcast is a production of SavannahSpirit.com, where you can find a large selection of Om and yoga clothing, spiritual jewelry, and unique fair trade gifts from the Far East. Now here's your host, Ashton Subbo. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Savannah Podcast. I am really excited about our show today and who we get to talk to. But before we dive into the topic, I just want to remind you, go over to savannahspirit.com slash contest if you haven't done it already. Even if you have done it, it's a new week. Go over and do it again because if you can enter each week, you get entered into a $100 gift prize for savannahspirit.com who helped to make these podcasts possible. So our show today is about the Bhagavad Gita, but in particular, to, to borrow the subtitle of our guest book, the Bhagavad Gita as Psychedelic Guide. Our guest today is Scott Tightsworth. He's a teacher, author, and editor. He's a lifelong student of Indian philosophy and modern science under the tutelage of Nitya Chaitanya Yati, himself a disciple of Nataraja Guru. And an editor of the, he's edited the books written by these gurus. He's also written a host of books himself, including Liberating Ourselves, The Path to the Guru, and Krishna in the Sky with Diamonds, the Bhagavad Gita as Psychedelic Guide. He also teaches extensively on the Bhagavad Gita out of where he lives in the city of Portland. He's been doing that since 19, in the 1970s, along with his wife. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. So as I, as I mentioned there, you, you teach quite extensively on the Bhagavad Gita. And I think, you know, given that it's one of the most important, I, I feel like one of the most important books, uh, literary books and spiritual texts of, of human culture, uh, obviously it's, it's well known across the world. Not everyone knows about it in the United States, but I think our, our listeners have a, a, a basic grasp of it all. But tell us a little bit about, about your background and the, the first time that you experienced the Gita. Well, that could take up our whole hour, I think. <laughs> uh, my teacher was a master uh, expositor on the Gita, and the first time we met him was in a class on the Bhagavad Gita in uh, one of the churches downtown in Portland in 1970. My wife had uh, stumbled across a copy of the Gita in her high school library and thumbed through it and, and was completely nonplussed by the apparent support of, of war in the book. And it always bothered her. And when she saw this class was happening, she said, I want to take this and find out what's going on with that. So we went in and this, uh, you know, we've all had extraordinary teachers here and there in our life. This guy was amazing. And uh, it was at a time when there were a lot of charlatans around spewing all sorts of things, but we, we got lucky. Continued to uh, study the Gita with him and became his editor of English language books. And the first one we worked on was the, his Gita. So uh, it's something I've, you know, was immediately attracted to and uh, have spent a lifetime with. Uh, then when he died in 1999, we were all kind of sitting there stunned and, you know, a lifelong student's uh, just taking it in and not thinking that we could ever measure up to that. I, I realized if I didn't start passing this on, it was going to go away. And that's how you become the next generation of teacher. I was not the kind of person that thought, oh boy, I'm, this is my opportunity. It was like, oh no, nobody else is doing it. I better do something. Anyway, the first thing I taught was the Gita. And I thought, 
I better see what other people are saying about it, uh, as long as I'm going to now be supposedly knowing what I'm talking about. And as I read the, the other books uh, that are out there, I was horrified and then I became really angry at how it basically turned the message that I had been taught on its head. My teacher presented it as a textbook of liberation, scientific textbook of liberation, to overcome all the impediments of life and all the duties and necessities and the things that hold us back to become optimally expert in whatever most is most meaningful to you, your dharma, in other words. If you ask uh, the ordinary orthodox Hindu or many of these writers what the Gita is about, it's about doing your duty, first of all, which is immediately wrong. <laughs> it's about getting out of doing your duty to become your authentic duty, which is impeded by all the duties that society lays on you. And the more that I went into it, for instance, the, the, the first chapter, I should say, you know, the, the Gita is a dialogue between Krishna, the, the guru, and Arjuna, the disciple. Krishna is a wise elder. Arjuna is the confused young person who's in a conflicting situation. Uh, it happens to be a war, but the war is a symbol of, of the baffling aspects of life that we encounter, that, you know, our lives are not a smooth flow of everything going just perfectly and without any problems. We are here wondering what's going on and how to deal with it. And so Arjuna lists what his society has told him is what his life is about. And he repeats those in the first chapter, and many commentators think that, that the Gita is supporting those ideas. Actually, the Gita is going to tear them to shreds. Uh, you know, doing your duty, uh, giving rice balls to the ancestors, you know, worshiping the ancestors, all of these social constraints of 2,000 years ago. Arjuna says, this is what I've been told, but I don't see how it's going to help me. And Krishna says, okay, well, we need to figure out what's going on because that's, it's, that's not going to help you. <laughs> Let's, and so they begin this uh, 18 chapters of exploration of how you become an individual grounded in your own wisdom, your own knowledge, able to act independently. Uh, so I was, you know, I realized I better write something. I better start do doing something to counteract this, these tragic, wrong <laughs> interpretations. I mean, they are true orthodox beliefs, and academic books like to focus on, you know, what everybody believes, whether it's right or wrong. But I was taught the highest interpretation of this amazing book, uh, really at the top of the heap. Uh, and I thought, oh my gosh, we better put this in the record too. So I started with verse one, chapter one, uh, spent time meditating on it and then writing. And I went through the entire 700 verses. It took 10 years. It's around 1,500 pages, uh, bringing in, you know, the, the scientific discoveries that are weighing in, uh, the MRI uh, interpretations of the brain and so on really do fit quite well. And the new neuroscience goes along with the ancient wisdom. Uh, so I, I wanted to bring that in and compare. And so anyway, it's a huge project. I had no, my, my teachers were very puritanical and there's nothing about psychedelics in the way they presented the Gita. But when I got to chapter 11, which a lot of other people have suspected something about that too, I, and I just continued my uh, working uh, verse by verse through the thing. And I started thinking, oh my gosh, you know, this is really familiar stuff here. Uh, this is a, you know, this is a veiled trip that Krishna is guiding Arjuna through. Well, it was, it was interesting too, because I, you know, being with uh, or having read the Gita for, Gita for a number of years, the, the, the thought process of 
it being a, uh, or, or in particular, chapter 11, which is what you focus on in your book in, in Krishna in the Sky with Diamonds, that it's a, a, a psychedelic experience, not so much the, oh, I'm opening up to God, but the, the psychedelic experience that many, my, myself included, are familiar with, and then actually reading through your commentary on that, so much of the, the, the pieces fall into line of like, wow, okay, this, it, it makes a lot of sense when looked at from this angle, which, as you said, it might not be an orthodox sense. I was curious to, to find out if you're, if you're, what your teacher's opinion on psychedelics were, but it sounds like you started drawing from this more after he passed. Is that correct? Or, or did he know about he, he would not have endorsed this, though he, he did have one psychedelic experience of his own by accident, uh, but that's a, another story. Anyway, he was, you know, he came here in 1970 when our culture was wild over drugs, uh, good, bad, and indifferent, and he was very strongly opposed to all drug use because uh, you really need to have your full attention to receive the, the kind of teaching that he was offering. Anything that distracts your concentration as an impediment. He was very strong, staunchly against it, and I was not planning to say anything about it, but I, I couldn't ignore it. And then I, I looked back, and uh, Soma, the mysterious psychedelic, we don't know what it is, but, but that's, it's referred to specifically as Soma in the Gita. And looking back, the Sama Veda should be called the Soma Veda. It takes all of the references to Soma out of the Rig Veda, which is the main Veda, but about half of it's about Soma. And it just takes all of those verses out and puts them in the Sama Veda. That's all it is. It's, it's the same stuff, but it leaves out the non-Soma part of, of, this, of the Vedas, the, the original religious texts, I guess you'd say, of India. So it was very much a central part of the experience of learning wisdom from a guru. Was to, And the Gita follows this beautifully. It starts out right where you are in confusion, bafflement, uh, curiosity, and a desire to, to be free. And it teaches you a, a way of thinking that is called yoga, a balanced integrative way of looking at the world that is part of the cure right there. It's very important. So there's 10 chapters of preparation, in other words, of going from this dependent, duty-bound social person to the free individual who's ready for a worthwhile uh, psychedelic experience. Gives it to him, and the, the last seven chapters are how do you integrate that experience into your life so that you can then become an effective person? So anyway, that's the, the nutshell of it. This is very important, but it, it can't stand by itself. And that's where so many of us got lost in the 60s and 70s taking psychedelics was there was no one around to say, okay, here's what you do with this. And I have heard from people who were really in that position. They were so happy to read my Eat a commentary because this is what you do with it. <laughs> that uh, they had been waiting. You know, uh, one guy wrote from uh, he had been at the University of Michigan, and Leary came and said, "Turn on, tune in, and drop out." And they all rushed to do that. And he said, "We waited around for the next teaching, but there never was one." You know, and I finally found your online. Uh, Gita commentary. I'm so happy because this is what I was waiting for back then. We never got. That was a very nice to hear. But you know, these wise yogis who wrote the Gita or put it together really knew that that was the most important aspect. You know, anybody can take a drug, but not that many people can integrate this unitive experience of oneness and embracing the, the much larger aspect of ourself and integrate it into a functional human being. Yeah, with a lot of experience in various shamanic traditions and, and different uses of, of entheogens and plant medicines, that's always been the thing that I've observed the most is that it grants, it grants these amazing visions, access to to insight and wisdom, but without the foundations to integrate it back into, it usually either sends people further spiraling downhill, or they just get completely lost and caught up in, in what they're doing. Like they can't, 
they just forget about it. They can't integrate it into what's going on. So it's like, oh my gosh, I've, I've seen God. I get it all. It all makes sense. And then three weeks later, they're in the exact same patterns that they were before utilizing any type of entheogen or medicine. Yeah. Well, that's what the, the neurology shows us that, you know, we have certain uh, neurological formations that, you know, you can have a vision, but they aren't changed. So if you don't continue to work with that and to reorient your neurology, you still have the same mindset and you will sink back to that. So if you stop doing anything, and unfortunately, you know, because drugs are an easy way to have this experience, people have got the feeling that, well, you don't have to do anything. You can just, you know, if you do nothing, then it happens. That's not strictly true. If you do nothing, then your neurology that you've already built up in your whole life does it operates as it's designed to do, which is fine. But if you want to change and become more enlightened, more open, more visionary, you have to unhook some of those stuck places in your neurology. And that takes repetitive, dedicated work. And that's the part that, you know, the drugs don't necessarily give you that knowledge. You have to get that from a teacher or a a scripture like the Gita or something. Well, there's also the aspect of willingness and intention. And you, you talk about, I love, so in the verse six of of chapter 11, you're, you're talking about the, the, the Rudras and Satya and these, these different characters that, that are being shown to Arjuna and describing them. uh, I believe the, the word for the, the Rudras that you used was, was the tragic storms and this idea that whether it's through plant medicine, whether it's through a meditative experience, you're going to encounter these these beings, but of course these beings are inside of yourself. Uh, we, call them, we call them traumas, these, these past things that have happened to us that are going to come up in those moments. And if we're not willing to look at them, to turn into them at all, we're not going to get anywhere in this work. And it could actually make the situation, compound it, and make it more challenging and more difficult because we're reinforcing then those traumas instead of actually looking at them. So when, when viewed as a, whether it's a, a more psychedelic experience that comes through meditative practices, which absolutely those occur, um, or from ingesting some type of psychedelic, how is the the, or how is viewing the Gita as a psychedelic guide, in particular this chapter 11, helpful for the average spiritual seeker? Well, I wish I knew. <laughs> I hope it is. Well, you know, I, I think the whole Gita needs to be taken into account. But uh, of course, I realized that this chapter would be what would attract attention because uh, psychedelic takers read and they're interested and they want to know more. Uh, and it turned out to be true. Our inner traditions jumped on that book immediately. And they, they usually take months to decide on a book. They immediately said, this is what we, something we want. Well, you know, there's a lot in there. I, I, I looked it over cause I, I wrote it quite a while ago and, uh, the first thing I noted reading the first verse is that it, you know, it, it was the 11th chapter of my commentary. So it starts with a bang. It starts rather abruptly. Probably should be a little prepared before that. And hopefully the introduction will, will help with that. I haven't had this question asked before. So <laughs> I would say it's showing people that they're, what they're experiencing is aspects of their own mind that in, symbolically understandable. Uh, They're communicated in the Gita as symbols, but I have interpreted those symbols in terms of the modern uh, mind and the modern person who probably has taken psychedelics or is thinking about it. To make that connection that, you know, uh, when Arjuna is seeing, you know, countless eyes and arms and legs and all of this, what that actually means. It's not that you're hallucinating and just seeing a lot of eyes and a lot of arms. Everything in the Gita is a symbol. And reading it, if you don't have any background, you don't know what those symbols mean. So I have provided uh, one possible and actually pretty well-educated interpretation to what those mean. And when you read that, I think you hinted at that also, that it's, it's like, oh yeah, oh, it makes sense. You know, when you're just reading about a kind of a vision of fire or brimstone or whatever, 
what does that mean? I've written down, okay, this is what they intended you to understand from that. And when you hear that, you go, oh, wow, right, okay. And I've had that experience, so I know what they're talking about. It really, you know, it's a way of bringing it to clarity. I think it's a pretty uh, invaluable book as far as that goes. I think, if, you know, if you happen to have taken a psychedelic and you're really confident that you understand it perfectly and you're in balance, you're not messianic, you're not inflated, you're really right on the money, you don't need something like this. But if you're wondering, what the heck was that all about? Uh, this chapter is quite revealing. You talk a little bit about your, your own experiences with substances like, like LSD and things like that. Was there, were you introduced to the Gita and then had these experiences and then it was like, aha, now I'm understanding that. Or was there a natural draw to try it because of that? What, where did that, where was the connection made for you for the first time? Oh, well, you know, there was a little bit of, of suspicion of this back in the late sixties when I was introduced to these substances, but I, I don't know that I'd even heard of the Bhagavad Gita. We all read Siddhartha in, uh, high school that was going around and a few things, but we, we just were trying to have new experiences and get away from a murderous uh, war oriented society that we lived in. And that was obvious. And still do. It wasn't, you know, it was the, the Gita came after for me, but quickly after, because when I, I was at Stanford briefly and, um, that's where I had my best LSD trip, a, a really, a truly a wonderful breakthrough experience. And I immediately thought, I need, I need a guru. I need to find out how to do this without taking anything. You know, I don't want to be going up and coming down. I want to stay in this place. And to do that, uh, and I really stopped. That was the end of my taking psychedelics, pretty much. A few little things after, but, but then I moved rapidly to this guru and i because of my deep desire for that i was drawn to this amazing guy and the gita was what he was teaching it all just like i hope my book does for people it just clicked i mean going in there everything made sense that my teacher was the first person i had ever met who seemed to know what he was talking about the rest of us are all making guesses, estimates, and trying to cover up our lack of knowledge with bluster and false confidence and all of that. This guy, you could just tell, you know what he was talking about. I'd never met a person like that in my whole life. And it was like, wow, okay, let's, let's get down. <laughs> but that's how the Gita came about. And again, with him, there was never any dread of anything except that don't do any mind-confusing substances, but get totally focused on what we're teaching here. So for those that are interested in the Gita or read the Gita or had some experience of the Gita, how does viewing in particular chapter 11, but allowing this context of the psychedelic experience, whether it's from an ingested substance like like Soma or uh, other psychedelic, or whether it's induced through a, a meditative experience, how does viewing it in this light shift or change the message of the Gita at all? Or, or, or does it? Like what, what benefit is there? What advantage is there to seeing this in this particular part of the Gita? Well, probably nothing. I mean, everybody realizes that something really extraordinary is happening in chapter 11. And you really don't have to fight over how it happened. My very excellent teacher would have just said, you know, there's a transmission from guru to disciple. I happen to feel that it was a psychedelic substance and there's plenty of support for that, but it doesn't matter. So whatever it is that takes you out of, you know, our, our, we spend the first part of our lives trying to craft a persona that will get through life without injured or insulted. And it's a very small creation that the persona is a strategy devised by an infant. And we expand on that, but it's basically a desperate measure. So we think we are much smaller than we actually are. What the Gita is, is showing at this point is that we are this vast, vast being. And we need, if we want to be everything that we are, we have to somehow emerge from this egg state of a persona to our full glory. And that's one of the interesting aspects when I'm talking about the war thing in 
Christian in the Sky with Diamonds, is uh, how Robert Oppenheimer quoted that those very lines when he, they set off the first nuclear explosion. Because the connection, not only was LSD basically discovered at the around the time of the first nuclear bombs, but interestingly, those nuclear fission and fusion show how much latent power and energy is in the humble little rock in your hand or the, you know, atoms. They're, they have almost infinite energy. Well, the psyche also, while it looks kind of like a rock from the outside, is also packed with nearly infinite energy. The Gita is showing how to release that in just the way that a nuclear explosion releases somatic energy. This is releasing the energy of the psyche. And uh, if you look at, for instance, the United States political state right now, there's lots of ways that the negative side of the psyche bursts out in these huge explosions, uh, periodic wars and oppression and hatred and all of that. But what if there was a way to release the beautiful aspects and that kind of infinite energy and power that is so often channeled into negativity in human species. But this is, so it's a technique or maybe a non-technique would be a better thing. It's, it's an invitation to open up that nearly infinite power of our inner being in ways that are channeled to beauty, kindness, compassion, sharing, all of the positive qualities that we know so well. I'm not going to recommend anybody take psychedelics, though the evidence of history is that those things are very valuable for achieving that. But as you say, meditation, uh, turning to it, uh, you know, musical experience, diving into anything. My teacher said, you know, follow your interest. It's what excites you. What, what you know, everything is okay, but there are certain areas where you go, wow. God, that is the coolest thing I'm going to, you know, and you start putting energy and time and, and dedication into that. Those type of interests are what invites that additional energy of our inner self into our life. And certainly the, the last word of the Gita is that that should be happening all the time. It's not that you get a drug and you release it and that you have that one experience. We are trying to have that happen as a continuous process. And to do that, there are mental reconfigurations, which invite it. And what is often called prayer saying, uh, you know, you pray to God, God is your inner being in, in Indian philosophy. So when you pray, you are actually just inviting the 99.9% .9 of yourself that you don't know anything about to come join and participate in your life, whatever way you do it thoroughly recommend finding some way to do that rather than trying to force yourself to be content with mediocrity, which is what society wants you to be. When you mentioned moving from this, this egg stage into this, this larger persona. And I know you, you, you also said, well, you're not advocating people use psychedelics, but do you feel that, that psychedelics, whether it's in the, the, the context of you know, soma or something like this, that, that they have a place on the spiritual path or, or perhaps more aptly put that they, they could have a place if done within the, the context that perhaps it was done in whether it's shamanic cultures ritualistically or in, again, we don't really know what the substance of soma was, but some people say, well, no, it wasn't a substance at all. It's all an inner thing. Other people are very convinced that it, that it was indeed. I mean, some people link it to Amnita muscaria, which is a, a certain type of mushroom. I mean, is there a place for entheogens, psychedelics, on the spiritual path? Well, certainly. And I, I'm sure you're aware of some of the studies that are going on now in terms of using psilocybin and uh, some other things. That's the main one that's being worked with in terms of helping people to get over PTSD and end-of-life anxiety and things like that, which... Going from being miserable to being happy is, if that doesn't define what spirituality is all about, I don't know <laughs> what, it would, what it would be. So whatever can do that. And there is ample evidence that these substances 
are very, very helpful. They're not exclusively the only way to do it, but most people do not have the time, energy, or inclination to do what it takes to, you know, 30 years of meditation in a cave in order to produce the experience you can have in one day with a guided trip. And again, anyone who's looked into it, you look to all these other cultures, these things were a part of becoming a citizen, basically, becoming becoming an adult. Your, your rite of passage from a dopey kid to a full-fledged adult was that someone, the shaman in the tribe or the, you know, the medicine person, whoever, the, the wise person guided you on this experience and it opened your eyes to the greater context of our life. And you realize your connection with everyone else. Uh, and that gives you the inspiration to live a life in harmony with everyone else. And again, look at our society with everyone pitted against each other and and, you know, arming themselves to the teeth in hopes that they'll get a chance to kill everybody. That's the exact opposite. That's what's missing in this culture is something to remind people or to show people that we are all made out of the same stuff. We are one species that's been totally uh, confirmed by science and that we are all in this together, both psychically and physically. Uh, all of these things which make you a useful citizen as well as an, uh, uh, a highly uh, happy adult. Well, it's, it's one of the things that I'm, I'm truly fascinated by is you know, having lived out of the United States for so long and seeing how other cultures relate to everything, really, um, be it spirituality or society or culture. And, I, and I, I'm always wondering what our culture would look like if we did have rituals like this involved, where there is that clear distinction between, okay, now you're you're moving from that phase of childhood. You know, we've got things like rituals in college and stuff like that. Not that everybody goes to college, but even then, most people are coming out of college 21, 22, and they are still absolutely children. They, they haven't developed functional life skills, as it were. I mean, so much of the Gita is about... You know, developing skill in the world uh, through these 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 various yogas, and, and I'm, I'm always just wondering how do we get there? How do we get to that place where I mean we're seeing it now? Where there's there's kind of an underground ayahuasca movement at the moment in the United States. A lot of people are doing that. We're, we're seeing similar conditions as there were in the in the 60s and early 70s. One of the things and the big concerns I have with let's say South American or Central American shamanism is that a lot of it is here's the medicine it will teach you which much of it does teach these amazing things but as we already mentioned it doesn't give you a real context or container to integrate it back in and then at that sense everyone's just going out and doing drugs right because it's not anything that's lasting that's that's really helpful in their long term which is one of the reasons why I appreciate your book so much because it gives a a an avenue for that to to be integrated into as you said a lot of these symbols and stuff like that but how do we get there? How do we how do we culturally start to create whether it's our own rituals or experiences or understandings around this stuff so that we can start to affect change? So as you were mentioning, letting out the, the positive explosion of, of light instead of the explosion of, of darkness and hate and, and bigotry, how do we make that shift individually and then spread it culturally? Well, I wish I had an easy prescription. <laughs> Me too. From the Gita's perspective, it's always an individual effort. I mean, they were very individualistic. There's no social movements here. And I, I don't know that that's completely valid. But what is valid is that the only way to make uh, meaningful change is to first work on yourself. Uh, what most people tend to do is do a little bit of work on themselves and get a couple of wild notions and then go and try and impose those on other people. That's actually a very negative behavior. It's, it's the ego trying to skip out on being disciplined by disciplining other people. And that is a major source of conflict. So I would say that facing up to the fact that we are representative of all the same problems we see in the world around us and dealing with those within ourselves is the critical place to start. When you wind up really getting it, 
then you will naturally uh, be able to have a positive impact on others. And I have to admit, I, I had a vision when the, the books that I've written on all the chapters of the Gita, 18 chapters, I, I had this vision, wow, every yoga studio in America will have these, you know, six books or whatever with the 18 chapters, and people can read these and see this amazing, liberating philosophy, and it, it will, you know, be the kind of wise parental figure for all of us that we need because the Gita does have that. It is so profound, so brilliant, especially with it needs to be, you know, elaborated on. Just reading the verses, it's a little bit too terse for most people, but an elaborated, explained uh, Gita is uh, magnificent. It's super psychedelic. <laughs> That's not going to happen, apparently, because the tension is elsewhere. But the main thing, uh, we do whatever we can. We are led by opportunities. Life is always offering us chances to do things. And if we are sticking to uh, what we think we are, we're going to miss most of those. But if we're open and say, God, I'm going to pay attention to what comes along and I'm going to respond to that, I think that would have a tremendous impact. We, we restrain ourselves from doing that. We, we've learned growing up to just tune out the very wise suggestions that our inner being or our inner God, if you want to call it that, is feeding us. It's not an easy thing because we are subject to self-delusion and there's all kinds of voices in there that are not our authentic inner being. And that's where the, the role of a guru or a wise scripture or something that you can trust to weigh in on, on, on your decisions and to help you get through there. You know, it takes Arjuna this entire long apprenticeship to Krishna. And only in the end of the last chapter does Krishna say, okay, now you can, now you're ready to act as Arjuna. You are, you are yourself. I crown and mitre you over yourself, as Dante would put it. Uh, it until then, he, Arjuna is not ready. We are not ready. We need to have the full experience of learning everything about who we are and how it fits into the world and before we can trust ourselves to act with expertise. One of the areas that I think that the, the Gita is so important, and I would, I would love it if, if your books are all sitting in yoga studios across the country, is because a lot of what people are getting with yoga, uh, and um, there's historical reasons for this, but it's, it's the Yoga Sutras. And Patanjali at his heart, I mean, you can, you can interpret the Bhagavad Gita uh, dualistically as well, I guess, but Patanjali was a dualist. And so we, we create this this schism in in modern yoga of well you know i'm i'm doing my yoga practice every day but life kind of gets in the way if i could just go to india and do more yoga then then i would be enlightened or oh my life is a distraction from spirituality because it's all about getting to this place where my mind fluctuations aren't bothering me anymore and that's the most important thing let me get to that deathlessness of ego and you mentioned it here the the gita is about being fully yourself and following that instead of trying to self-impose egolessness on yourself. It, it really gives a different interpretation. Uh, for, for what we know, Patanjali was talking to ascetics. He was talking to people that were moving away from the world, and therefore his yoga makes a lot of sense. His yoga doesn't seem to make as much sense to the modern Westerner practicing yoga today. I mean, most of what they're practicing isn't even Patanjali's Raja Yoga anyways, it's Hatha Yoga. But the, 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 the Gita and why I think it, it really really is ripe for an absolute explosion in Western culture is because it's giving us the opportunity to view life as our spiritual practice. The experience of being and how we show up becomes the, the practice itself instead of this idea that I have my regular life, which isn't spiritual at all, and then I have my spiritual practice, which is where all the spiritual stuff is. And it, it, it gets so confused and convoluted that way because we're, we're not seeing the, the vision of, of the divine in every experience that we are, and that then creates, I mean, we see a lot of hate, you're talking about the political spectrum, we see a lot of hate on one side, but you also see this strange 
intolerance from the other side, which we, you know, spiritual communities that are extremely intolerant of views that, that don't fit their mold of how things they should be. It's perhaps the, the shadow side or the dark side of this, this split personality, which I think that the Gita really addresses so wonderfully throughout. Well, that's, that's a real important point. And, you know, I, I came to my guru with the, you know, the cliche that we have to do away with the ego. And that's still all over the place. And he said, no, no, no. We just want to make the ego the right size. It has a very important role. And what I've realized after is that by suppressing the ego, that's what happens to the, the baby, the infant and the child who are forced into the straitjacket of society. Their ego is crushed. And that is the, the nuclear act that brings the explosion of hatred out because your ego is not allowed to function. It is crushed and suppressed and the crushing is like pushing the plutonium into the uranium and having it go boom. So it is absolutely critical. And this is, uh, you know, it's in the Gita and also definitely in my interpretation of it. Not, Not all of them, you know, a lot of people work it around to like the Gita is all about Krishna being in charge and your ego shutting up and listening to Krishna. Uh, that is exactly wrong again. This is, you need your ego. It's the, the final arbiter of your behavior, but uh, you don't want it too big. You don't want it too small. And that's the yoga. Yoga is always about balancing the extremes and finding the synthesis of all aspects of the range of possibility. It's not picking the good over the bad, which is what we think we're supposed to do, and which causes those schisms that you very accurately mentioned just a minute ago, but to synthesize the entire field and integrate it into your being. That's what opens up the vastness of a beautiful explosion. If you could synthesize... Um, or, or, or distill, I should say, the the message of the Gita in, into a way where someone you're you're going up in an elevator and someone's saying, "Man, I'm I'm really uh, struggling in life right now," and uh, you know, what's what's this whole Gita thing about? If you could distill the message into something that concise for you, what's what's the most important message to get across that comes from the Gita? Well, first of all, I would probably be very reticent <laughs> about that because uh, epitomizing things is tends to take away all of their power. What, but I had to do it, which you put me in that position. I would say the main message is that we are oppressed by our upbringing and our society. We are vast divine beings squeezed into a very small space and the Gita is a scientific analysis of how to reclaim our full being and the nature of that full being is profound happiness of a balanced nature so it feels good it's really a wonderful thing to to reach for it may take some work and pain and so on but that's, that's it. We're trying to get out of this straitjacket that we are all in, whether we know it or not. And, you know, we are in a comfortable, we have been in a comfortable uh, place behind the lines of the empire and all of that with all our needs met and all of that. So we think, oh, yeah, life is good. We, we've got it all. And it's just as oppressive as somebody who has nothing and is scrambling for every bite to eat. You know, we do not realize how much we've given up to get to this place. And the Gita is inviting us to see, to bring that to the planet because we, everyone needs that. We need to share that. We need to help each other to express that. Well, I, I appreciate you, you playing along and, and being willing to distill it, even though it's, as you said, it, it kind of pulls away from the larger stuff. So I'll, I'll give you an out here as well. Um, I, I've really enjoyed our, our conversation. And let's say with that same person now, and, and for myself and anyone listening, okay, you've got the distilled message. Now, where can they go? Where, where's, I mean, you've got tons of information on your website. You've got other books. How can people start to con- continue uh, down this this path of inquiry, getting to know the Gita more? Where can they find out more about your work, your other books, and, and all the, the different teachings that you have? 
Well, that's nice. I hope my you'll have my name spelled on your uh, on your uh, site. So yes. that I'm the only Scott Tightsworth on the planet. So anyone can look up my name and you'll see Nietzsche Teachings. That's my website. It's a pun because Nietzsche means eternal, but it's also my guru. And most of my what I think of as my original thinking comes from Nietzsche, but also eternally valid uh, ideas. Um, so it's all there. Uh, you can read online uh, all of the Gita stuff, lots of other things, introductions to my guru's books, uh, which were my first writing projects. These are, uh, you know, if, if it's suitable for you, these are, you will find that they're the most exciting thing you've come across. Uh, I do hear occasionally from people who are absolutely so delighted to finally get in touch with something that really resonates and makes sense with them. I'm happy to share that for free. And I also talk to people. I have email conversations. Uh, people, if they have issues they want to talk about, I love to do that. I'm retired, so I have time for that. So, you know, look that up. One one thing that I, I one last suggestion is that our whole society is based on the savior complex. We have a feeling that an outside agent is going to rescue us from our mess that we're in. Uh, this goes deeply into every aspect of our culture. And the Gita is suggesting that we have to be our own saviors. So uh, feel free to get in touch with me or someone else who's uh, something to share with you. But uh, also try to overcome that sense that, that we get as dependent children, we're dependent on our caregivers. And that just steamrollers into this, you know, Jesus is going to come save us and take care of us. So we don't have to do anything. This is about, okay, uh, nobody's coming to save you. You are already saved in a sense, and everything you need is within you. So start to activate all of that. And, you know, most of my writing supports that in one way or another. There's so many aspects where we don't even realize how bound we are. It's fun to uh, explore those. Uh, one of some guy wrote me and said, "God, you, I loved your book, but you seem so enthusiastic." I was <laughs> like, "Shouldn't I be enthusiastic?" It was like a criticism, you know. You should be dispassionate or something like that. Mm-hmm. No, you should be ecstatic. You know, this is something that makes me happy, and it cures me of all the nausea and misery I feel when I, you know, look at the political world and the refugee crisis and all of the terrible news things, which are true things. This is something that helps me get back to realizing that you know, we humans are spectacular, the most amazing things that we know of. And uh, despite all of our problems and our stupidities and our ignorance, we are so wonderful. Experiencing that as a living uh, existence is what we need. And we would get along so much better if people felt that way. So start out, go out there and you feel that way. <laughs> add it to the world. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on the show today, Scott, and sharing your, your wisdom, your, your passion and insights. I'm sure our, our listeners have definitely learned a lot. And I really encourage everyone listening to go check out Scott's books, check out his website. He's got a ton of information on his website as well, uh, scotttightsworth.tripod.com. And uh, you can get his books also where, wherever books are sold. Scott, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Oh, it was a pleasure. I enjoyed it. And at the very bottom of each page is my uh, email address in case anyone wants to write. Thank you very much. It was uh, really fun and maybe we can do it again someday. I would love that. And for all of our listeners out there, I hope you have learned something new today. I hope you all have a very present moment. Thank you so much for listening. Namaste. Hey everybody, it's Ashton here with an announcement. We're starting a weekly contest giveaway over at Savannah Spirit. If you'd like to enter into the contest to win one of our weekly prizes, go to savannahspirit.com slash contest. If you enjoyed listening to the podcast today, we'd really appreciate it if you went over to iTunes, left us a review, leave us some comments, and share this podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy it. 
Also want to invite you to go check out Savannah East, which is the name of our blog and also the name of a Facebook group where I interact with guests and our audience. We'll post recent episodes up there as well as interesting articles relating to our guests and or the topics on the shows. And again, thank you so much for listening. Namaste. You've been listening to the Savannah Podcast. To find out more about Savannah, go to savannahspirit.com or follow Savannah on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Savannah Spirit. For daily inspiration, check out our blog at savannaheast.com. Be sure to join us next week for a new episode. And thank you for listening to the Savannah Podcast.